Hello everyone, bringing you another interview today with a veteran of the Falklands War and we're talking to Richard Tottle today who at the time was serving with 4th Regiment Royal Artillery and he very kindly to, agreed to sit down with me and recall some of his experiences leading up to and during the war. So without further ado we'll get into the main part of the video and listen to Richard's recollections. I joined the army back in the British Army back in 1978 and I actually joined, I came over from South Africa to join. Right. Because at that time, my parents are originally from Yorkshire, so they're from Sheffield, and my parents immigrated to Africa, oh, I can't remember, between mid-60s, late-60s. Um, so we ended up living in Zambia, Rhodesia. My dad fought in the Rhodesia War, and, um, and he we then because of the war we moved down i let, end up moving living with my mum and my stepdad and we moved to um south africa and then from there things i was a bit of a rowdy teenager my folks said why don't you find out if you can go and join the british army because um we'll speak to uh the british consulate in johannesburg to find out one could i join or not because it was going to be a long time before um, we could, uh, no, no point going all the way to UK, can't join the British Army. So it was said as long as I had third generation, but we were British, we never gave up our citizenship. So, so 78, I joined, I actually joined Depot Para. I started off in Para Ridge, Depot Para. And uh, I went through up to as far as P Company, Fell P Company, and then decided to transfer to the artillery so those days depot para was an older shot then i went across to the depot for the artillery which is in woolwich uh, just to do my basic gunner we didn't have to do basic training we were already well qualified yeah as uh, as an infantryman so we then just did basic gunnery on the 105 light gun and then we got posted I got straight back to Aldershot, yeah. straight to 4th Regiment, who were in North Camp at the time, and uh, and ended up joining a battery called 2-9 Corona Battery. That was a senior battery in 4th, and we were always on spearhead. So we we supported 1 para, 2 para, 3 para, and, you know, as a battle group, depending what battalion was in Aldershot at the time. In that meeting, we ended up doing supporting two parrots. We've done a lot of work with two para, either in Germany or overseas or in Canada. And mm. we, because from UK, you used to get a Wainwright to do your training in Canada, not Battus. Battus is when you were in Germany. We used to get a Battus. Right. And then, really, we were we were on Easter leave. I think we're on Easter leave. And then we had a, always had a code word, and a code word was. Pegasus, if you heard the word Pegasus or somebody knocked at your door or came into your barrack room, I was married at the time. And if they said Pegasus and you just had to follow the instructions. So, you know, on the 17th of April, if I remember, give them plus a day, got a knock on the door late at night and it was Pegasus. Get to back to camp or leave cancelled and get on parade for eight o'clock that morning. Yeah. And that's when we like a lot of us said oh by the way Falklands has been invaded we're on standby to go and we've got to do a number of cha training checks zero our weapons get the guns ready and at that time nobody really knew where the Falklands was never even heard of it a lot of us thought it was somewhere up one of the islands up in Scotland or something so yes. very naive young soldiers at the time but then there were some of our NCOs and senior NCOs didn't really know where the Falklands was either. And then so really everything kind of kicked off and started. And then we were found out, yeah, two paras going and we would be part of the two two paras battle group. Mm. Yes. So we ended up traveling down with them on MV Norland. And, and what were your sort of thoughts at this stage? You know, as you said, is not knowing where the Falklands were and everything else. As the news sort of filtered through of exactly what was happening, what what was your thought process? Um, we think we wouldn't go to war. Mm. 
um, we a lot of us thought, OK, we'll go through each stage, each day, each scenario because the boats for ships weren't ready. They, they had to have helicopter landing decks. The Norland had two. They had to be built. They had to be tested. So the de delays of everything of when we actually going to go. So we thought, ah, it's not going to happen. You know, it's, it's the political, the politicians will, will sort it all out. And then it's only really then said, no, you're going. So everybody was quite hyped, really. Yeah. Everybody was quite excited. You know, then we learned a bit of history very quickly, how far we had to travel, you know, about 8,000 miles. And then he said, oh, by the way, we're going by ship. And then the guns went off on the Europic. Uh, uh, a small crew of, of artillery went with the gun. The Europic was the main also the main ship that all of the am ammunition for the battle group yes and you know for various wasn't just for us it was for the marines and everything it was fully loaded with am ammunition and all the artillery ammunition as well so it wasn't just for <clears throat> two nine batteries but you had two nine commando regiment that were going because yes. it was the commando brigade was actually in charge so Mo, we were part of five infantry brigade at yes. the time um and, and then um, and that's what it was. So really, it would next minute, you know, yeah, you've got a definite date you're going. And if I remember, it was I left home on April 26. And they bust us down to Portsmouth and there was a Norland, ball of the Norland. And no, that yes. was it. So yes. and it was very much. And and a lot of the things somebody asked past the questions, what do we say to our wives or families or our mums and dads and everything else? How long are we going to be? And they say, don't know. No. And that's the scary bit. Yeah. Don't know. It could be six months. It could be three months. It could be a year. You know, gents, you could be going to war and you really don't know. So that's a bit of the first bit of scary bit um, about it and that. So what you're going to do. And then you soon got into a routine, you know, because we mm. were so luckily two Paris whole battle group were on the Norland from artillery to cooks to medics to engineers because nine squadron was with us. Um, everything that a battle group needed was on the the, the Norland. So we, we all got pretty well with each other. Yeah. You know, some of the guys were my neighbours when I lived in Mary Quarters. Um, some blokes you never saw them, you know, and you bumped into them after the war in Civvy Street. Oh, I was on the Norland. Oh, were you? Didn't even know each other. Wow. So it was a small world afterwards. But then going down, things started getting, you know, you got to get, start getting into routines. We were a fairly fit battery. Um, part Fourth Regiment were fit because we we're on spearhead. So they actually, as a normal regiment, we were really fit. And then we just got, got into more of a routine of fitness, running around the decks of the ship and PT on, on, on the decks. And then you then then you did a lot of a lot of lessons started coming. So besides um, medical stuff, first aid, doing things that you had never thought about slightly different things that you would never do again now. They're just so old fashioned. <laughs> um, so that. Um, and then you used to get briefings about the Falklands, where they are, what they're for, where they had them. And then we had a big, quite a few lectures of a, a Royal Marine Major. And he had sailed all around the Falklands. And he was about to produce a book and he wasn't allowed to because it, they put it under the Official Secrets Act at that time because there was too much information about all the inlets and everything. Um, and it was like that. And then it was getting your kit, you know. The one thing they gave us, they gave us these art, Arctic um, boots, but they were more like ski boots. We had to give them all back. You couldn't break them in. They were absolutely useless. So we still had the old DMS and putties. Yes, which um, gave so a lot no, of trouble later on. From They Putsy. gave a lot of trouble later on. Yeah, you're right there. So, um, so it's getting everything together. You know, you've got mm. your Arctic warfare. You've got your Arctic. To talk, talked about the Arctic rations. They said you may have not because we'd never been to Norway, so they'd gone through yeah. Arctic rations, how they were different to your normal 24-hour ration pack. Um, the clothing as well, you've got Arctic clothing, so from thermal underwear to 
your socks, stuff that you would never usually have. Um, um, and then you just had to get used to all of that stuff. And then <laughs> shooting, firing. Yes. Um, I don't know. There's a funny little story where we were doing off the back of the Norlin bags of rubbish were flying out, flying over and were as target practice. And one of our guys shot an albatross. And that is a big no, no, because yeah. the merchant Navy, Navy guys, it's bad news and bad luck. And we had to hide this guy for about four days on ship. Yeah. Keep his head down because it was just not the known thing to do. And he didn't do it on purpose. It was just flying low and it got it, got it, got it, got in the way. So, yeah, that was some things. And, and then we had movie nights, you know, it's like anything in the Navy or the merchant Navy. You've got a different movie every night so everybody would go in down into the main canteen area and the old 16 millimeter projector would go go off and that and then even to the point i think we hit especially further down so before we sorry before we got there we stopped off at freetown um, and that was just to get fresh supplies and everything and freetown nobody was allowed off the boat and then from there we went to the ascension island and i was lucky enough to get on to Ascension Island, good enough to buy the Sun newspaper. And, that, and, and, and what they did, they, they um, rigged up a helicopter and flew the guns in. Three of the guns got flown mm-hmm. in just to make sure the rigging and everything else for the guns were all right. So we, I think we were on the ground in Ascension about half an hour. Not everybody managed to get off the boat. Then it's back. And that's, that's the point where things started to happen and come more serious because you started, mm-hmm. uh, you would wake up in the morning, you'd go out on deck, and then you just see ships and then another day more so the whole task force was starting to form up in ascension island ready before they um went down so all the infantry to so the paras and the marines they were all getting ready to um practice landing so all the landing craft were going everywhere and landing off in ascension uh, everything you could see all of a sudden things were getting this is getting real now mm. we used to listen to the world service every day because that was give you kind of up-to-date information especially yes. what the government was saying what maggie was saying and we still thought no we'll turn around and go back home this will get get sorted and, it's, and as you further south you go and then they start saying oh by the way we've got to do anti-submarine drills and things then you start thinking oh this is this is now getting really serious yes you know when this ship starts zigzagging and you've got to lay on your bunk with your, your life jacket on and, and ready and you know various different things like that and it, it all starts clicking into the pace and your training got more intensified and busier and the fitness got more and more because we were getting further south you know and it was yeah, yeah. you know and then and then you've even not at night time, you're not allowed out on deck because it's you had to go through various curtains to get out deck, the blackout yeah. lights. Yeah. Then some guys would stag in on, you know, with um, jumpies on, on posts around the ship at various places at night. And then there was lots of things starting to happen. Yeah. It yeah. was really getting serious. Briefings got more. You were told more more stuff what's going to mm. happen what's going to do and then you know um and before that i mean we even hit we got into, into the south atlantic you know we hit a you know the sea was quite bad for those that people that aren't very good you know when you get a force nine storm it and you're in a kind of like a, a north sea ferry which, yes which which yeah, the yeah. northern was it was quite frightening that was because it would make so much noise when it would go up a swell and then crash down on, on the water and everybody used to think we've just been torpedoed or something it mm. it's it was but, but at the time though we were still watching life of brian you know <laughs> that, that life of brian was going on the bad storm and people were being sick everywhere and but they just carried on watching the movie and, and that and then and then the further south you got and then you realize and then your bosses come down and turn around so gentlemen that is it we have been ordered to go this is now um um ready and left for you to 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 go yes <clears throat> you know so that gets quite uh uh 
a bit scary and that yes. and then briefings so the training kind of stops and then it's briefings and there's drills to do um and then people and then just as a couple of not when they were working out who was going to get off the boat first who's going to get a landing craft and then you all start moving up decks as it's your as it's your your turn so two para got off first yes and then and the landing crafts and then we got flown in we got so when we got into san carlos bay and that's where they told us we're going to sneak into san carlos bay right on the other side from stanley it was a better way to, to get in um more a bit more of a of a surprise um and then especially before think before that the old bar grano got torpedoed yes. by us so that hit home even more to say you know this is for real we're going to do it for real you know you do start feeling a bit worried at that time and getting a bit you know a little bit scared thinking you, you know you've got to go for it and then the old adrenaline will start you know especially when yeah. it's your time to go up on deck and we got helicoptered in and then halfway of us getting helicoptered and the guns getting dropped off and we're getting dropped off at, we went to our first gun position was at head of the bay house so it wasn't in yes. actually san carlos it was at a place called head of the bay house it was a farm we took over a farm um so to the right was sussex mountains um where two power had to tab up and dig in at the top and we were not we were below that where the head of the bay house was and and as we got all dropped off then we had the air warning red there was an air warning and there was a few Skyhawks of mirages come screaming over as we did it because they were then going to send to the bay where all the a lot of the ships were and that's where yes. they got a bit of a pounding so then yeah you you know this is it you're in for real and then everything kicks in actually what what you've got to do so when your gun arrives it comes in the gun's position you've got to get surveyed in and then once all that's done then it's right you've got to do a routine you've got to get sort your gun platform out you've got to get ammunition comes to you you've got to pack un, unpack your ammunition you've got to prep your ammunition and you've got to find out what you're going to do after that and then things mm -hmm. just progress progress from from there and you sort of fall into the training of of as you were saying of, of what you've got to do to to get this yeah 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 you do right. and everything you yeah. either we try to dig trench i mean we had to dig a trench one to sleep in and one that you had to fight from if you had to and then you put your old turf over the one where you're gonna where you're gonna sleep in and in the end we had to abandon them they just felt filled up with water yeah. so you go to the depth they want you to go and then they just filled up with water and in the end we just put our two-man bivvies up underneath the cabinet and we just slept on those two-man bivvies and then we had shell scrapes and if, so if we had air warning you used to get air warning red air warning orange air warning green and then the problem in the early days with air warnings we would we were told to put our helmets on get your mm. rifle get your weapon go jump in, in the trench that you had made because you're going to have to fight from there and, and then it would take you would waste an hour maybe an hour and a half waiting for the aircraft to come screaming over and in the end we just binned it you know air warning green air warning amber i think we only moved at red when they were about to come it just prevent, stopped you from doing stuff um, yeah. you just sat there wasting doing 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 nothing until you got in part of your your your, your routine and that i say very interesting and this is all this is your position to basically defend the, the bridgehead at san carlos at that <laughs> initial stage that was that and there was also supporting whatever the companies in two power yes, wanted um, yeah. so we did push we we started we did some firing at charge super i don't know if you know much about the 105 light gun not a huge amount no only right only it, as as a piece, the ammunition not so much charge super you can hmm. lob uh, a 35 pound round nearly 17 k's away at charge super but it doesn't do your gun very good the royal recoil system it, it knocks it it knocks you to hell you can just feel it when you when you fire it yes right so you know we were pushing at in the early stages because we thought there were the, i think the infantry thought there was a patrol base somewhere and they said look can we just have a go with the guns to see if they could hit it yeah, and we were going the elevations that we're going doing in peace. You wouldn't go do that in peace time. Right. You know, you would you would you were pushing that gun a little bit more. 
would charge super and high elevations to try and reach those targets that that were requested from by our OPs because the artillery has OPs uh, who who just mix with the infantry. You know, they're yes. assigned to each company and they will call in the artillery fire for you if they want it. Um, so after about I think a week of us shooting, not a lot of um, ammunition. It, it, we were told no, the 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 big boss of uh, three commando brigade or the CO of two nine commando regiment turned around and said, no, stop using t- charge super. This is just knocking the guns because you will mm. break the seals and everything else. It's a very powerful charge to to to, to use on a light gun. So we 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 stopped doing that. Right. Um, but then you know things. Then um, I suppose. The attack on Goose Green started. Yes. And there was a debate, were we going to fly in three guns or the whole battery was going to fly in? And then, because we're under three commander brigade, they said, no, it will go to a couple of guns, one of their batteries, because they'd been done night flying in Norway. So they thought they were better for it. Um, so we didn't. We did. I think I just read, read something earlier on. I think on the push on, on Stanley that we did do a lot of other firing as well uh, as around. So, you know, that was about 14 hours of, of continuous firing mm. that happened for Goose Green. And then there's the same with 2-9 Commando, one of the batteries. They did a lot of firing continuous for about 14 hours. Um, to the point, there was 10 of us that got um, selected from the batteries like a fatigue party. We um, got a, a, a BV, you know what BV mm. is from the from 29 Commander Regiment came picked us up and we mm. had to go to eight commando battery, fill it full of ammunition, small arms ammunition, mortar ammunition. Then we went off to Goose Green, <laughs> cross country over Sussex Mountains, down to the two Paris Heschelon to give them the ammunition that they needed uh, and wanted. And uh, Creek House, I think Creek House is maybe where they're Heschelon. Yeah, and we had a few Picaros flow over, take a few pot shots at us, mm-hmm. uh, the Heschel, and then we moved forward. They said, right, guys, um, you need to go forward to the right to the front line now because we need some more rounds and we need this. They're running short. But by the time we got there, it, 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 the battle, it, battle had, had finished. Yes. So um, we handed out ammunition, cigarettes, went back to the Creek House, the BV went back and that took wounded people back. And then we spent a night at two Paris Heschelon. No sleeping bags, no nothing, because we were we didn't think we would be out that long or no, you know, no. powers to be to say they didn't take your backpack or anything. Off you want, off you go. So it was it was it was cold. You now they gave us a room. The window was blown out and, you know, they are buddy buddy cuddling each other. Yeah. You know, we had a sergeant yeah. with us and he said, Gents, you're gonna to have to do it if you don't like it, or she's gonna freeze. All right, it will be, it won't be a rough night. It's gonna be a rough night. So when we eventually got back, they gave us about 24 hours off to kind of catch up with sleep and that. But that by that time, and the weather was starting to get cold. It was the yeah. worst. And if other people have told you, it was the worst winter for a long time. So we expect, you know, with a wind chill about minus 21. Down yes. there, but I don't know. If you look at it now, we just got on with it. Mm. Yeah, persevering through the yeah, yeah, it's... the cold, and but then your feet started getting wet, and then the DMS boots were no good, and then a medic would have to come round. We had our own medic, and he had to come around, and then he had to make sure that um that uh, we um had to uh, check our feet. Make sure you're changing your socks every day. Take your wet socks off, put them inside your body, next to your body to try and dry out every day. You know, even though our battery commander, when he came around to visit, said, guys, you've got to keep changing your socks and we're going to have problems. You know, a few of the guys did start going going down with um, um, trench foot and foot rot and, and all the rest of, rest of it. Yeah, a very unpleasant conditions and not something the boot was able to you know protect you from it no absolutely useless absolutely biggest useless piece of kit you know mm. and then from from um 
head of the bay house we moved and as we moved our, our another battery came down on the qe297 battery came to join us yes and our co came to join us so our own headquarters so we then came under our back under the command of our own regiment then we weren't attached to three commander brigade anymore and so they took over our gun position and we moved forward to Luff cove yes uh, and it was a real ideal gun position in, in a small dip. And when the cam was up, you just couldn't see the guns properly, especially when the, the guns, uh, the barrel was down. So if you, you, it was ideal gun position. But that was when we witnessed um, the old two mig, two migs, and about two or three. Skyhawks came screaming around. So to the left of our gun position, we saw them coming around. And then after we think over that ridge, because the, the Scots Guards had arrived by then, and they just opened fire, and you just saw a blanket of tracer right trying to catch these aircraft. And what they did yes. spun right round and went round to Fitzroy to where the Galahang was. You know, and the Welsh Guards were. And the next minute, we heard boom, boom, boom. And then you could just see smoke in the distance and we didn't really know what had been hit or if a plane had gone down it's only that we had a couple of our a senior nco and an officer was down there and they came back and said what had happened is it right on site what it was and there and then and we started prep more get your routine in get sorted get your ammo sorted and that's when we started doing a lot of firing and a lot of pushing of, mm. of ammunition you know doing it and every day or every day or mainly the not evenings you're doing a lot of firing yeah. at various places or sometimes it was just to test um get around on the ground just in case a gun something happened there then they could just do a fire for effect yes um on that position and then from there we moved to um eight k's forward to a ridge i think it's got a ridge with no name and half three one troop so in a troop you have each troop has three guns at that time how we were set up and we had gone three of those guns had gone forward and when we'd been dropped off they dropped us too far forward we were more forward than the in infantry because there was a Gurkhas came came up and they were getting, were getting counter battery they were, they were the Argies were shooting at us because there was no P near us but they couldn't quite get us because we were just below this ridge and they couldn't get it over. They're only firing a, a gun, a 155 millimeter gun at us, uh, which kind of slowed down, did stop. And then the next day, the rest of the battery turned up the rest of the guns. And that's when the serious, serious fighting or firing the guns got going. You know, you were, you were each night, depending on what battle tumbled down, um, system whatever was required you know we were f firing five six hundred rounds a night because everything was done at night then you finished then you would prepare all your ammunition again then you get your head down and then you would just start again so we were going through a lot of ammunition quite you know i think especially when you've got the calling in artillery fire the ops you know they're taking a grid square out by using what 12 16 guns firing on the same grid yeah and just going for it you know when you get 10 rounds fire for effect on 12 guns or 16 guns that's a lot of ammunition coming coming yes. coming down down on you and you're being resupplied by helicopter at this point as well I'm yeah all helicopters we moved yeah. we had we, our, we never saw our vehicles our vehicles were got bogged in yes. on one ton yeah. land rover so we got helicoptered everywhere ammunition there was quite a you know our ammunition was getting from what i heard a little bit low towards the end mm. of that conflict you know so we, that's why they got a bit of a pounding and they had to move forward um, um and with it and then really we we i think that another scary time is when we were actually fired by the uh, argentinian artillery mm. um, even though it's one gun and they were doing air bursts so an airburst, uh, it will go up above X amount of meters above you. And then all you would hear is a, a whistle from the gun coming over and bang high up. And then you would just hear a whistling and it would just shrapnel would just go 
everywhere, but they got the airburst too high, so it wasn't. Um, but there were some big lumps of shrapnel you know, laying around, something like this. You know, and luckily some guys got hit with it, and because they had so many layers of clothing on, they just thought they'd been punched or something by somebody. Yeah. And then it's until they see a rip and a bit of steam coming, smoke coming, because these shrapnel are so sharp and, and hot. So, and that kind of stopped doing our job. You know, we were still firing under the fire because yeah. we were still quiet. And I think, I think uh, the, the, S, the, I mean, the SES went in and took out the OPs and the Harrier screamed over and may have taken out the gun that was giving us a hassle. But the problem with the Argentinians, their guns, they were firing them round about Stanley or putting right. them near the hospital yeah. and firing them for the side. So nothing could be really done, done with them. Yes, and a, a longer range guns. I think the Argent, the big one five. Yeah, they had they had one five five millimeters. Well, we had one oh five millimeters. Yes. Yeah, the bigger. They got bigger rounds. You know, they're about yeah. uh, they're about fifty five pound rounds, where ours were about thirty five pounds. Yes. Round of HE. So, yeah, that was that was pretty scary. You know, if you mm. thought you could, you hear the whistle in the bank, and if you did, you could dig quickly and deeper. Yes. You would. You know, it, it, and that was only one gun. So God knows when we were firing 12 or 16 or even more, 24 guns firing on a grid square, you know, on the, inf the Argentinian inf infantry, them, it must have been not very nice at, at all. And that was, was that your sort of your last firing position before Stanley or did you? Move? Yeah. yeah, yeah, it was. It was it was the last, you know, then we, we, yeah. we, we got. Um, so when all the battles were going on around at the different mountains, mountains and the ridges yeah. and everything else, then we got um, guns tight because there was going to be a possible surrender. So nobody shoot at anything or anything other or your own weapons. And then we heard that the surrender came was it June the 14th. If I remember. And then from there, we started getting Arctic Warfare tents started coming flying in where they came from. These big Arctic tents, you know, are, are typical. It's, it's just about over now. Um, yes. And then we moved to, they moved us to a, a farm. I can't remember where it was. And um, we started living in a um, sheep shearing barn. We stayed yes. in there. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was quite, yeah, I think that's what, I think the lull of being on such a high for such a long time and then it stopped. Yeah, a lot of guys want to be left alone. And yeah. I know beer started coming in, we're out beer and people just have a good few beers, sat in the corner and just don't want to speak and get on. And then the Sergeant Major were trying to knock you in, get shaved. You know, used to have a bloke's had a moustache that joined the, the sideburns and 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 all and all all the rest of it. So uh, it it they they did get kind of uh, yeah that we couldn't understand. You know your no. kit was in tatters and I'll sew this up, sew this up. And everyone's going no 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 whoa 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 what is all this? You know we've been fighting for the last nearly three months or so, and now you're trying to say to us do this. So that was a bit hard. I think it had to take a few senior NCOs to tell Salt Major not the right thing to do e you know, or, yeah. or else you're gonna have a bit of a problem um so and it was that so then, you know we hadn't and then we had one sergeant match to rig up a shower and then he said right two by two you're going into that shower it's hot you're not going by yourself two by two you i'm gonna time you 44 gallon drum you're gonna take you can keep your top kit but your socks yeah, your underwear, your thermal long johns and that, they're all going in that bin. I'm going to burn a lot of them. We haven't had a shower since we, a wash, that's all we had. A wash and maybe a shave now and again. Now and again. So it was trying to get us all sorted and cleaned up and, and, and the rest of it. And then our, our battery commander, then Maggie, decided to keep a lot of prisoners. And then she put them on the boat, the St. Edmund. And Mendes was on there as well, and the conscripts were on there, and then our battery commander kind of volunteered us to go onto it so we could get ourselves sorted out, proper beds, proper shower every day, and then we guarded those um, prisoners. 
yes. until Maggie, until the British government decided what to do with them, sort them out. By that time, two para had gone back on the Norland. They were on the way back home. We weren't. So there was a lot of umming and ahhing and why are uh, my our battery commander going mad? Why has that happened? We should be going back with them. Why are we still here? But in the end, um, he he because he tested eight regimental head, headquarters so much, they flew us back. So we managed. Some of us, some guys had to stay on a rear party. Some guys that said there's some space on a on a navy ship that's going back. Who wants to go? A few put their hands up and said, okay, you can go. And um, then a uh, rear party had to stay behind to do a handover. Who's going to take over? The bulk of us then we flew on, on our hook from Stanley up to Ascension Islands yeah. and then on the VC-10 back back home, really. Mm. Um, and then we uh, we uh, had then, yeah, came into camp. They said there's beer if you want it. Your wife and kids, if you had them, met you at Bryce Norton. Um, they said you can take as many duty frees. We don't care if you've got fags or booze. Don't care because you all got it at Ascension Island. I said duty free tent, Ascension Island. Yeah. Don't care about that. If you've got weapons or anything, that's what we're interested in. If you if you've got a license and you can prove you got a license, we'll sort the paperwork out and all the rest of it. Got into camp, hand your weapon in, and then they say bye bye. Yeah. You're off eight just, weeks leave. I think it was eight weeks leave or something like just, that. Yeah, just from that quick straight back into society, as it were. Yeah, there was yeah. no briefings, no. Uh, and then when we came back, there was nothing. Oh, are you? Yeah, fine. Yeah, you know. And, you, know so, you know, I think I, I might have had funny nightmares for a while afterwards. You know, I remember being on leave and, and um, I was with my wife and my son at the time, and then I, uh, the, um, there was an air, on the air show, a farmer air show, mm. and the, yes. um, oh, what's the air force, our air force, Red Arrows flew over, Spated, and yeah. I actually yeah. knocked my wife and my daughter to the ground and hid behind a car. You know, there was little, because how you were, you know, the noise and the, yeah, yeah. Of that type of aircraft. So, yeah, a lot of people had a few little issues and stuff got back to work and as if yeah well done that's it okay we've got no kit we'd have to see about where we're going to get a kit from and then yeah. we got given guns again and and before we know you knew it you were back into you know, oh by the way we're on spearhead again and that means you're on no 24-hour notice to move uh, no briefings no how are you how you cope with it and you just had to get on with it again how's your hearing because we didn't have probably the hearing protection we had in the Falklands wasn't very good and after the first rounds they, they, we had like an ampy boxes yes yeah. and they had bits of oil in them and they had batteries but as soon as the first few rounds went off the oil we used to burst and you used to put them to one side you know and even the little bud things that you used to have they used to pinch off the air force guys they were no good in, in the end not the amount of rounds that we were firing and, and, and that so I wear hearing aids now. Um, yeah. Can't prove it was the Falklands, but the specialist audiologist just did say it could be to do with, with your military career. Yes. And I do now. I have now. I'm a member of a, a veterans hearing group. An amount of 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 guys from the forces, and that's all services, complaining yes. about their ears and their tinnitus and. And that, I was a lucky one. I managed to get uh, a free. I got a grant from the British Legion. Hmm. <clears throat> took a year to get approved but i've been one of the lucky ones before the money ran out and, and, yeah. and got them because i don't have any high-pitched notes anymore they're they're gone all gone yeah and it's not worth the agra and i've been out too long now to because yes. i left in 93 i left in 93 so uh you can't really go and fight the mod or try no. and get a war pension and that so uh, Yes. On, sorry. I was just going to say on the topic of your your further career in the army. Obviously, you say you came out in '93. What was your career progression from then over the next uh, um, eleven years? What? How... Um, um, well, we got uh, as a regiment, we got posted to Germany in, mm. because Fourth had had the parachute role in 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 yes. Aldershot. Not all of us were parachute trained. Certainly, I wasn't parachute trained. Like all the OPs had to be parachute trained. Some guys and the guns were parachute trained. The CO was 
<coughs> usually para trained our battery commanders were all para trained um so what happened then in 1984 there's another change that drowned so we went to osnabrück in germany mm. and then 7rha came back and they took over the role again as seven parachute regiment royal horse artillery and they took over from that so we ended up so it was a very and it was a very different soldiering it was a hype going to germany because i lived in germany for nine years mm. the regiment i think my regiment spent about 18 years or something over in in germany yes um now they're at top cliff my old regiment but 80 84 we went over and and then trying to be soldiering waiting for the cold war and and everybody comes a different way of doing things in germany compared to how we were height of readiness and all the shot type of soldiering we did in all the shot compared to when we went to germany so it was a bit different a lot different yeah um from, from that and uh yeah so then i think i then asked for a posting i think i got a posting in 1986 i went to a different regiment in lipstadt um, i was already a lance bombardier then and yes. i got a bomb became a bombardier uh became a sergeant I, I managed to finish off as being a sergeant and then my uh it was in 49 regiment and then options for change came in the 90s early 90s and we got disbanded yes and, and and that's a bit of a crunch when you're quite happy within your regiment and this commanding officer says guys a year time we're not going to be here that's it we're on wind down now end of the cold war yeah yeah it wasn't necessarily the cold war but they were just reducing some of the regiments because the royal right, artillery had many regiments loads hmm. of regiments and they're kind of shrinking it started shrinking it down because we all had track vehicles you know we had m109s in those days the american self-propelled yeah. gun 155s <laughs> and then so what happened then I'm, so you could get posted so i was a sergeant so i got posted to where there was a vacancy and i ended up in it's not called this now it used to be called 12 air defense regiment royal artillery it's now just called 12 regiment and uh options for change came back in again and i took early retirement slash redundancy i managed to get it because i couldn't settle in that regiment i just there's a point in your army career and then a lot of people i've spoken to they just go you know that's it time's up right you know even though you know you're going to pro progress with your career mm. you know you know that you're you're um what you got to, you know your pension reasons you need to stay in and at least do you you're 22 in that, but it wasn't right anymore. It just wasn't, and it was just that time, time to to leave. So I left in, mm. officially left in October 90, 93. Right. Just over 15 and a half years. Mm -hmm. So there we are. I do hope you found it interesting. I certainly did. I always enjoy conducting these interviews. I always find out tidbits of information that you wouldn't find elsewhere. And it's, it is interesting to hear individuals' particular experiences of conflicts, which obviously you may read about, but it's interesting to always hear a personal uh, perspective on these matters. So thank you very much once again, Richard, for taking the time. It's much appreciated. If you have found this interesting and you'd like to see more from the channel, please do consider subscribing if you haven't already. And whether you're newly subscribing or you've previously subscribed, please do make sure you hit the little bell, the notification button down below. That will, of course, alert you when I upload future videos. If you really like my uploads and you would like to support the channel, you can. Both Patreon and PayPal are linked down below. And as ever, a huge thank you to everybody who supports the channel using those two methods. It's greatly appreciated, all of you. Thank you all very much indeed. If you'd like to follow the channel on social media, you can. Facebook, Instagram and Twitter are all linked down below. And if you'd like to get in touch but you don't really use social media, there is, of course, an email address down below as well. That's everything for this video. So until next time, bye for now.